Good morning, everyone. How are you? Did you have a, have a good evening last night? Have a little bit of fun? Excellent. My name is Josh Atwell, and I am here to talk to you about managing your infrastructure stack with PowerShell. Little disclaimer, I'm not going to show you a bunch of code. I'm not going to teach you how to use a commandlet. Uh, I'm not going to you know, show you clever little things that I've done with PowerShell. That's not entirely true. I'll show you a couple of little things. But what we're going to talk about today and this is something that I very much want you to be engaged with me, point out where I have gaps, and expand on this. This is a conversation starter, and we're going to talk about a lot of the challenges and the capabilities of PowerShell when you look at the total infrastructure step. Okay? If you're on Twitter, I highly encourage you to use the PowerShell Summit hashtag. You can mock me and, and heckle me all you want. That's fine. I'm accustomed to that. Uh, throw it on Twitter and we'll have some fun with it. Uh, and I just thought Poshit was just a fantastic hashtag for so many reasons. So I threw it up there. You can use it or not. I'm, I'm, I'm good either way. But um, as I said, I'm Josh Atwell. I'm a developer advocate at uh, SolidFire, which is now part of NetApp. Um, and we have the uh, big thanks to people. How many people were using PowerShell right at the very beginning? Throw your hands up. All right, how many started with version two? And how many of you do not like raising your hands during presentations? Excellent, I like to tear away my audience and make sure that I don't count any of your lack of votes. You guys are boring, I'm just kidding. Not name calling here. Um, so thanks to those folks. Um, so a little bit about me, and, and I have two hours, so I'm gonna talk about myself as much as possible. Uh, I'm kidding there too. Um, but it, it is, there's some things that I think are really important before we get started so that you know, we can level set on why this topic was something I submitted and I thought we should talk about. Um, I started out my career working for a small civil engineering firm where I did desktop support and then server support and started virtualization. That's where I got started with PowerShell. My intent was to automate some tasks. It started with Exchange. And I think a lot of people who got started early on, Exchange was that first integration that they worked with, right? I mean, can I, can I get an amen, right? It's, that's, that was when Microsoft really legitimized PowerShell as a tool that you should invest time and energy in. And I did that. And VMware then released the VI Toolkit. Now, we're going to get into a lot of these integrations here in a minute, but you know, as part of the, this narrative, it's important to understand that once the VI Toolkit became a thing, now there was this opportunity to do something much broader and much more impactful in the environment than simply managing my mailboxes and, and accounts and all that stuff, right? Uh, so that took me into to CarQuest, General Parts, where I was responsible for basically re-architecting re the virtual environment and enabling the development team, right? How do I speed up their efforts? We have this really interesting thing we call today called DevHops, right? This was this was something, and you know, Luke, Luke and I have had a conversation on this. You know, DevOps isn't something new. It's something that we've kind of already done. It's just we, we have new tools and new methodologies to, to talk about it. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a little bit. Going into Cisco IT from general parts, I went from managing uh, hundreds of virtual machines to tens of thousands of virtual machines. And you know, in that process, there was, a, there was an element where the manager says to me, um, we, we need to automate so we don't have to have extra head count. And we need you to do that, right? And when you start looking at an environment that size, you have to take things into consideration that you don't normally have to consider because you have time. And we're gonna talk about a lot of those things in this session, about how you can leverage PowerShell for multiple layers of the data center, some of the challenges that are associated with that, and then how you address them. Um, and then now I'm at SolidFire, we were recently acquired by NetApp, and in my role as a developer advocate, I still write a little bit of code from time to time, um, but I'm primarily focused on getting people together who develop and work with our integrations and work in the infrastructure stack that are trying to solve problems, whether it's DevOps, whether it's just lean ops and trying to improve your operations, regardless of what they're doing, and try to help make them more successful. So I share the things that they do, I elevate the conversation, and I try to get people engaged. Which makes doing things like this fun, except for, I'm like, oh crap, I need to write some more code. So let's get into why we would PowerShell the stack, right? I almost feel like it was a challenge that somebody had. It was like, can you get salt and pepper into a slide? Yes, I can. <laughs> 
So we're gonna posh it real good. All right, um, and here's the thing, right? Why, why would you use PowerShell across the whole stack? Um, in, in your environments, uh, let me just ask real quick, in your environments, do you have control over multiple layers of your ecosystem that you could automate with PowerShell? Yes? Right, that's becoming more of the norm. You know, we, we hear a lot of conversations about silos. Frankly, I don't like silos. I mean, I like the fact that they hold corn, and corn is the primary ingredient of bourbon, and I'm a fan of that part of it. But when it comes down to organizational structures, I really prefer looking at it as disciplines, right? And when you break down that concept of there being some separation between you and a peer, or you know, how you look at your infrastructure, you now have opportunities to share and contribute with one another. And so I did this poll on Twitter, and if, if you're on Twitter and you want to, go to my profile, it's pinned. You can go ahead and contribute, and then I, will, I can pull that up at the very end to see how this number changes. But what I wanted to know is how many layers of your infrastructure stack do you manage with PowerShell currently? And I won't lie, I was a little bit surprised to have that many people claiming seven plus layers. Think about that. Seven layers of infrastructure, right? And we'll get into what, how I define that in just a minute. But um, seven components, seven layers of your infrastructure managing with PowerShell. You know, 10 years ago, if you would have asked anybody that was getting started with PowerShell if we would be seeing that kind of result, I, I think they would, that people would be a little bit bearish on that. Um, Jeffrey Snow would probably be bullish on that, as he should be. Um, but I also noted that the majority of people only have about three to four layers that they manage. And I think the fundamental element of that is based on what they have access to, right? Um, what, what they are able to automate and, and engage with PowerShell. Because this is what our environments look like, right? And I tried to, I tried to be uh, heterogeneous, if you will, and, and demonstrate, you know, there's more than just, because I think most everybody here is VMware vSphere. We have some Hyper-Vs, you know, maybe a couple open stacks. Anybody running OpenStack in here? Okay. Have, have you used the OpenStack PowerShell? Okay, so um, it exists. You know, some folks at Rackspace built PowerShell modules for OpenStack, right? And you know, when, when we look at our, our ecosystem now, we have, a, we have a few things that are you know, really pre prevalent that we have to identify. The fact that we have more layers, right? It used to be your applications were directly on physical hardware, right? And we still see some of that, but we now have a lot more layers, a lot more components. And one thing that's really important there is that in that complexity, there's a lot of interdependency. Anybody carry a pager, right? and there's something that goes wrong, what's the first thing you have to do? You gotta figure out what was impacted, right? You gotta figure out where it came down to. You're doing your root, you know, you're trying to find out the root cause and what was going on, and there's lots of layers that you have to consider before you can identify exactly where the issue is, well, unless it's blatant, like, you know, storage going down or a network, you know, you know, just going poof and disappearing, right? But with, with these additional layers, you have that additional complexity, right? You have dependencies that we didn't have in the past. And so it's really important for us to take advantage of the capabilities from a PowerShell standpoint uh, in order to, to deal with that. And then finally, another thing that I see in, in the work that I do from day to day is that our consumption models of our resources is changing fundamentally. Right. We, are, we are very quickly moving away from this, this world where someone calls you and asks you to provision something. Right. We're moving more to a world where people are enabled to do their own provisioning, they're, in, they're enabled to make their own changes in their environment. We're delivering IT as a service. Right. So what we're seeking now is opportunities to manage at scale. And when I say scale, I don't necessarily mean Cisco IT scale. Right? Your scale is completely relevant to what you're doing in your environment. So if you only have 100 virtual machines or you've got 10,000 virtual machines, you still have issues of scale. Right? You still have your constraints and the things that you're trying to do and what you're limited to varies. Right? We all have our limitations and things we have to work against. Um, and then you look at you know, where you have opportunities where you want to implement DevOps methodologies and tools and you're looking at like this complicated stack, and you're saying, how, how do I even get started? Like, what can I do, 
what, how do I start moving towards this? And how can I leverage things that I already know? We're going to talk about that today as well. And then I've already touched on, right? We want more IT as a service. We want to give people an opportunity to be self-empowered to do the things that they need and you know, not being completely reliant on submitting a ticket for everything that they do, okay? All right, so let's start with some of the tools. I didn't have a clever picture for this one, I'm sorry. She's hammered on her. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna add that at the end. So before it gets uploaded, I'm gonna have an MC Hammer uh, image there. Awesome, thanks. Um, well, here's the thing, right? We're all power shellers. And when we look at the things that we're trying to accomplish, a lot of the things that I mentioned earlier that we're seeking, the first thing that we think to do is, can I do it with PowerShell? It's not always the best tool for it. I would argue that generally it's a fantastic tool for doing these things. But you know, for us as PowerShellers, that is our native first response. Like, can I do it with PowerShell? And one thing that has fundamentally changed over the last five years is that in our infrastructure, we have more APIs. More products are coming to market and we are hitting refresh cycles in our data centers where we're bringing these products in where there is more extensibility, right? APIs are made available that will allow you to remotely manage and, and configure and take care of your infrastructure. And as such, we're seeing a lot more growth in PowerShell modules that support that. Now, this is not all inclusive. In fact, everybody take a minute, absorb it, and then we're going to have a sharing session where you can tell me the things I missed so that I can in include it later. Uh, and you know, to, to be fair, right, I work for SolidFire NetApp, right, we're a storage company, but I'll include competitors on here because I think it's fantastic that PowerShell has become so pervasive in our data center that we're able to do so many things with it, right? And when you look at um, at this, right? You've got your PowerShell, and then you've got the hypervisor stack, and of course Hyper-V is in there. I kind of consider that rolled into PowerShell, right? You got some server technology. I think Dell has a little bit of stuff, right? You got storage, where you got storage, and then you have things from the community where people are producing things, and the reason they're doing this is because there's an API. There's extensibility in our data center, unlike what we've had in the past. And it is allowing us to tackle these challenges and to, to jump on new things and, and deliver new capabilities in our data centers. And, and in this, we're going we're gonna to talk about how these look out, right? So this is the stack that we talked about. And when you look, as I mentioned, PowerShell is everywhere, right? Uh, most of these layers can be controlled with PowerShell <laughs> one way or the other. And I found the dead zone. And I don't know why I put that slide in there twice. I just thought you liked it, and so there we go. It's a great slide. So uh, community involvement, what did I miss? Just speak up. Did I miss one that you use? I have used a Revelo Logic. Del Equal Logic? Revelo and Tentree. Revelo and Tentree, excellent. OK, so I did pretty well then, excellent. Huh? Nutanix also has Nutanix? Nutanix? Yep, excellent. Dell? Dell, yep. System Center. System Center? Pure. Pure Storage. Pure Storage? Got it. That's it. Yep. Azure. Azure? That's right. Any others that you use? AWS. Excellent. All right, so, you know, for those listening at home and people that are, that are here, they, there is a lot that is possible, right? But that, there are also a lot of challenges. Um, we'll, we'll start with the use cases, right? What do we do with this big toolbox of PowerShell capabilities? <laughs> I have a memeing problem. It's a fun problem. First step submitting it. All right, so <clears throat> when, you, when you talk about PowerShell in the stack, See, I worked really hard on this graphic. It's not really complicated, but I'm just really proud of it. So I just wanted to, in every slide that I can. Right? Uh, when, you, when you talk about PowerShelling the stack, there, there are uh, a few low-hanging fruits, right? You got reporting, right? Everybody's reporting. And the interesting thing is when you, and when you talk about reporting is there's, there's a lot of different things that you might be interested in seeing from a report. And we'll talk about a couple of those in a second. Implementation is another. 
you know, being able to go out into your environment and configure net new resources, uh, looking at DevOps, how do you, you know, reduce time in the value stream? How are you able to improve the effectiveness of your development team and the consistency of your operations team, leveraging PowerShell, uh, maintaining configuration, obviously desired state uh, configuration is a, is a great example of that. And then also we're gonna to touch on extending tools. And these are tools that you already use that are able to take advantage of PowerShell in managing your, your data center stack. So the first example we'll look at is from a reporting standpoint and from an implementation and configuration standpoint. If you, if you are running a data center today, there is a high likelihood that you're running multiple VLANs. There's a high likelihood that you're running jumbo frames. And if you are in, and I see some heads nodding, so if your environment where you're doing this, has anybody ever seen a good situation from a VLAN not being consistent up and down the stack and being exposed? It never ends well. And it's a bear to find sometimes. Like, where is this traffic dropping? Why am I not being able to get access to this, this application? Um, same with the MTU, right? When you're looking at jumbo frames for storage or for you know, whatever the application is, if it's not configured consistently everywhere, you've got problems. And the challenging thing is, depending on the architecture and the infrastructure that you have, you may not have PowerShell up and down that. But look at how many layers are involved, right? If you are, if you are dealing with a VLAN, and it needs to be a specific VLAN for an application, right? That's, that's a lot of layers to have to check. And you have to deal with that with troubleshooting, right? And at the end of this talk, I'm gonna share an idea that I've had on how to help improve this. Apparently I liked this slide really well too, because it showed up twice. Interesting. So another great example is storage. Anybody have storage in their environment? Right? If you have virtualization, you have storage. Storage is fundamentally critical in virtualized environments. It is one of the key things that enabled virtualization in the first place. The, the ability to have a shared resource that's accessible to multiple hosts. Right? And, and when you look at that, there are some significant complexities around identifying, especially if you're dealing with performance and capacity issues, which, let's be honest, those are the storage issues that we deal with regularly, right? To be able to identify that this application has got a problem. And where is that problem? Like, where in the stack do we identify that? And when, when you're looking at your entire infrastructure stack and you're trying to you know get gain visibility into what's going on understanding the configuration understanding the relationships that the different layers of your infrastructure have and leveraging PowerShell to do it the most important thing that you can understand is that right there that relationship right what is that piece of information that connects one layer to the next and for most people when they're looking at managing you know, their infrastructure as a whole, this is one of the biggest challenges that they have. How do I identify what correlates that data store with this volume, right? Or that VMDK to that data store, that data store to that volume, right? What is that? Um, and, and then this, you know, I use, I use SolidFire for this one because I already wrote this code and I didn't have to write new code. Um, but uh, what, what we're looking at here is I need to understand what the volume is that's supporting that data store. And this is the LUN. Like, this is the physical storage that's being presented to the hypervisor to be shared so that we can provide resources to that application. And in doing that, I have to identify what piece of information is important and available both on the PowerCLI side, the VMware side, and the SolidFire side that makes that connection. And in this case, it's the SCSI ID, right? The, the NAA device ID. Right? And by going to PowerCLI, right? And we use the get SCSI one. By going to Power, PowerCLI, we know the data store that we want. We collect, we find the canonical name, which incidentally matches the NAA ID, right? For, uh, for, for the solid fire side. We get that, we do a little manipulation with splitting it. We, we get that part of the array and we store that. And when I go to find out what the volume is, I'm doing a where statement, right? So where, 
I'm, I'm getting all of the volumes and saying where this value equals that. Now, is, is there anything in this that just throws up a red flag of inefficiency? How are you getting them all? Exactly. Right? Why? Because it's easy. <laughs> and that's, that's why. Right? But, and, and then also with, with some implementations, and this is something that I really wanted to point out, and you know, I mean, this is, I guess you consider a negative on the solid fire side, right? We don't have a strong filtering mechanism. Why? Because the API was not designed to do that, right? The API just considers it sufficient. Like it's okay if you pull it all to, to get that. Right? That's not neither good nor bad, but when you're thinking about a large environment, think about what it would take to do a report when you have 100 data stores and how much time that would take. Okay, uh, so another use case, and it's in the book, just for you, Luke. <laughs> so when, when, when I was looking at uh, contributing to that, to that book, I was trying to think from a VMware perspective, why would I care about DSC? Because at the time, the work that, that Luke Deacons has done around DSC and VMware did not exist. There were no resources, there were no capabilities. Right, it, and it wasn't you know at the time you asked the question, like, well, what would you want DSC to do? Right, still very much in that exploratory phase. So I was I had this little bit of a conundrum. Right? So how do I demonstrate the value of DSC that would be useful to someone who manages a VMware environment? And so how many was it that managed VMware environments? You don't count. You said you don't raise your hand at sessions. <laughs> Okay, so what I came up with is this concept of the DMZ, right? No, that's not the concept I created, right? The demilitarized zone, this is where it's from in, right? It's behind a firewall, so it doesn't touch your regular infrastructure environment. It's virtualized, right? So it's sitting on the SXI. Um, it's managed by virtual center server. These are VMs, they're, they're on a VLAN that is dedicated to the DMZ, so they have isolation, right? Maybe not air gap, but you know, it's still isolation. Right, and you don't want to open a bunch of ports because every time you open a port, that's an opportunity for penetration from the outside. Right, you want your firewall as locked down as possible. <laughs> so, how the hell do you use DSC in this environment? Let's just say we've got hundreds of machines sitting there servicing you know a web application that is critical to your business and your business's success. How do you deal with that? How do you implement DSC? Well, I mean, you could put your full server out there, but that's a bad idea, right? You talk about honey pie. Somebody gets a hold of that, you're, you're toast, right? They can configure whatever they want, so you don't want to do that. So this hurt my head. It hurt my head a lot. Like, how, how, do I, how would I accomplish this? Okay, so we have the DSC full server sitting inside of our network, but we don't want to open up the ports, so how do you get it to communicate? Anybody have a guess? Except for Luke? Invoke VM script. That's a, that is a great way of doing that. Uh, so yeah, you leverage the VMware tools, right? Uh, for those who aren't aware, Power Power uh, Power CLI and uh, VMware vSphere, you know, with the VMware tools that are on a virtual machine, you can actually remotely execute through the VMware tools. It goes through the ESXi host directly into the guest, and it leverages the VMware tools to do things, right? And so what I did. Um, and, and this is all available on GitHub, right? If you want to see the full code, I just pulled snippets to describe, right? What I ended up having to do is we create the MOF file inside, inside the network. We copy that MOF file using the, what was it? Uh, copy VM guest file, right? We copy that file into that, and then we use invoke VM script to execute DSC, you know, and, and to execute on the MOF file, right? To get the configuration. Now, recognizing, that this doesn't allow that uh, LCM to be able to reach out and say, hey, am I still good, right? This, this definitely, you have, you're, you're pushing it out to, to the application uh, system. But it does enable that capability, right? You are able to go in, configure that, and get it out there without having to open up all the ports. So the key thing here is you have to use multiple different layers of PowerShell to accomplish this. Uh, and I will point out that uh, the, the original uh, idea and the concept was I would just put the, the code 
for building the moth file and everything, and to do invoke DM script. Well, you're only allowed to send one line of code with invoke DM script, right? You can have it call a script file and have it do other things, but you're only allowed to, to send one line of code, and that just doesn't work with DSC, right? It's just not going to happen. Okay, so this was this was an example of how to leverage PowerShell in a an environment against multiple different layers in order to solve solve a problem, right? And it was helpful because I'd already written the code, so I didn't have to write a whole bunch of code. I don't want to teach you guys commandlets, right? Like you guys know commandlets, you know how to use GitHub, right? So the next thing that I want to make sure that you're familiar with and introduced, and I thought I had a picture on this, but I, apparently I don't. So uh, I'll pull it up. Actually, I can just pull it up right now, I think. No, not connected. Never mind. Um, I, I'll pull it up at the end. I'll get connected and, and show you how Power Actions works. So Power Actions is a VMware fling. And if you go to labs.vmware.com slash flings, search for Power Actions, what Power Actions allows you to do is you install it in your vSphere web client, and once installed, it provides a PowerShell console in the vSphere web client. Right now, it's powered and backed by a power a server, a Windows server that's running PowerShell. Right, but what it does is it enables you to execute PowerShell directly through the vSphere web client. And the screenshot that I thought was here was a beautiful representation of this. So we'll get that in a minute. Um, but the other thing it allows you to do is it allows you to create scripts and files, right, that you can share, you know, you would create functions that you can share within the vSphere web client that will allow you to be able to execute against something. Um, use case for this would be, um, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but when I go into a vSphere environment and I see uh, all the storage, and there's data store, data store parentheses one, parentheses, data store, space parentheses two, data store three, data store four, data store five, because every time you install ESXi, it just calls the local disk data store. <coughs> I'm a little OCD. This bothers me, right? So uh, there's a power action that I've created and put out where you right click on the data store and you say, set the local name. And it goes out, pulls the SXI host name and renames the data store to that name dash local. Right, so now you have logical information, right? Um, now that's just an example. Um, you can also do things such as being able to, to select the network or select the data store and be able to query and say, what MTU is set up and down the stack, right? It'll check the switch, it'll check the port, you can check um, like Cisco UCS and the networking there, and you can have that send a report. So if you were in that troubleshooting situation, and you remember we had that full layer, that stack that we had to deal with, this gives you an opportunity to go in and, and take care of that and get that information and have it embedded directly in the vSphere web client, which is a tool that most of us are already using anyway. Right, so you're not having to jump around. All right, cool. Everybody can go check that out. It's not supported, so you know, be mindful of where you put it. It's not officially supported, but it's pretty cool. All right, I, I, was, I was kidding. We're, we're, we're not gonna talk about commands. All right, I was just kidding. We're gonna talk about some challenges. <clears throat> so here's some core challenges that you have to deal with. Yeah, I, I got problems. Um, so a lot of the core challenges um, that you that you have to deal with um, are how to manage the different modules and, and tools and the snap-ins that are made available, right? Um, the relationship mapping, which I've touched on, I'm going to get into a lot more detail about, and then dealing with problems that are associated with scale. So we're going to talk about like as you go to implement some of this stuff, what are some of the pitfalls that you're going to run into? So we'll start with multiple providers, right? Now there's there's two types of ways that uh, companies will provide PowerShell capability, right? Traditionally, it's been PowerShell snap-ins. Well, because that was the only way they could do it, right? That was the only real option. Uh, fortunately, most providers have moved over to delivering a module. Now, it's still developed in Visual Studio, still developed with C-sharp, .NET. It's compiled and it's provided out to you, so it's kind of locked. You can't get into it, but it is a, it is a module, right, that you can load. And you know, the, the thing that's really important to remember there is that with a module, it's, it can be transported, right? It's transferable. You can put that on any system, any 
any system that runs PowerShell that needs to perform a task. Right? So if you have multiple layers of the stack, you can extract these modules, put them in a central location, or you know, add them, as I described here, to the PS module path, so that when the session loads, that module is available, right? and you can then leverage it along with others at the same time. So if you're looking at you know, managing VMware and Cisco UCS and SolidFire or Pure or whatever, you can have all of those in, in the same spot. Well, this is really, really handy because, because it's transportable. You can put that on any system um, and you can now do a level of reporting right, and execution that you wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. You know, because if you're, if you're having to deal with multiple tools and windows and you know, everybody likes to talk about the single pane of glass, I think PowerShell is like the ultimate single pane. Right? It's the single pane of KDAS. Right? I'm quoting that. It's going on a t-shirt. PowerShell, single pane of KDAS. All right, so let's, let's show an example of that. Right, so you have your storage, and you're you're wanting to you're wanting to query for that information like we talked about. And for this one, uh, like with the VLAN MTU, uh, you know you, your common piece of information is the MAC address, right? The MAC address that goes from the Cisco UCS port that's being delivered to the ESXi host. You go out and get that. And you know, as, as I show it here, uh, I thought I'd show the, the full command list. But yeah, you can you go in and, and that, that information is accessible, right? That's that's neat, it's straightforward. Um, but you end up doing what I mentioned here, you collect it all, you filter, and then you grab the piece that you really want. This is wildly inefficient. Right? So the concept I wanted to share today, and I, I've talked way faster than I thought I would. Um, the concept I wanted to share today is, is something that I've been working on, and I'm very much interested in your thoughts on this as well. And it's what I call the application DNA. And when you look at an application and you think about all the different uh, relationships that are associated with it, the fact that there are multiple layers that must be delivered consistently and accurately in order to have that application actually function. In order for you to execute change, you have to understand this. And you know, let's just start with a reporting standpoint. If you're reporting on this, man, that is a bear. Like, I want to understand all of the virtual machines, and actually you can't even say that, right? I want to understand all the virtual disks that are associated with the data store, that's associated with the LUN, that's associated with this filer or this storage platform, this, right? Because in today's world, as everything moves to policy-based, you know, it could be anywhere. Right? So the concept that I've worked on, and I won't pretend like I've solved it, right? it's kind of why I wanted to have lots of time here so that we can talk about it, is when you're trying to get that information and trying to do those things, when I was at Cisco, uh, you know, we, we had a need for that kind of report. Right? We wanted to understand all the applications that were sitting on VMAX storage because it's expensive. And we wanted to make sure that nobody was on there that wasn't supposed to be on there. Are you kidding me? Right? Like that's, that's a significant undertaking. Right? Because not only did I need to identify what virtual machines were there, I needed to understand what the applications were, and I needed to understand who the application belonged to. Right? And I would run this report. And it would take about 22 hours, right? I was using Git view, I was doing filtering, it just, it just took time because you're still stuck doing a lot of this, right? So what I ended up having to do, and this was one of the big challenges of scale, is you end up having to break it out into multiple systems, right? So each virtual center server then had its own PowerShell server. And that PowerShell server was specifically dedicated for executing things against that virtual center server. I created some trusts in there. But now I have to manage a dozen PowerShell servers. And of course, you know, we, we did you know, the one ring to rule them all. We have one PowerShell server that would execute against all the other PowerShell servers. That sucked. But I was able to get it done in six hours instead of 22 hours. And what, what dawned on me, because like here's... Uh, yeah. But what dawned on me is that there has to be a better way of doing this. Because not only did I get into that, but when there was an opportunity that I needed to execute something or change something, maybe change the configuration, maybe I needed to move all those virtual machines that weren't supposed to be there, right? 
I have to deal with multiple layers of that infrastructure. And then, guess what I end up having to do? I have to do the same queries over again. Right? That's just dumb, right? Because it takes up time, it takes up memory, right? And, and that's time that the business would like back, right? Especially when you start thinking about DevOps organizations, right? And you're trying to implement things in a fast, reliable manner, and you're trying to sit, shave seconds sometimes, right, in your value stream. Why? Because the faster you can get through test and release, the quicker you get value for your efforts, okay? So the concept with the, with the DNA is, is that what if in the background, we kind of collect these relationship things. We find some efficiencies in how we collect, but in the background, we collect this information and store it. And you know, I've played with multiple types. They're all ugly, so I'm very much interested in the feedback on how to accomplish this. Um, but I kind of settled on JSON because JSON is just really fast, right? You can collect information into an object, pipe it out to a JSON file, and it's very easy to import it and then be object-based, right? And so the way this would work is you would go out and you collect that information just, just like I had said before, right? But you do it for everything. Like this is just a single one, but you would do it for everything and get those mappings. You pipe it to a JSON file, right? And when you start your session, you put in your profile to load the contents of that file. Right? And you can have this collection happen you know, several times a day. But here's the thing, most of the time that stuff doesn't change. Right? The relationship maps do not frequently change. The only time they really change is when you have to perform maintenance of it. Right? And so you know, being able to collect this information and store it into a file and then absorb it into an object you can then reference that object instead of doing that cross-platform query. You can get away from doing the get all volumes and find the one that just does the SCSI, you know, with this SCSI ID. Right? What you do instead is you just find the SCSI ID that's in that JSON uh, or in that object that you imported and you have all the information for that entire application stack that's associated with that. Does that make sense? Am I off my rocker? If I am, please tell me. <laughs> right, because this, this, is, this has felt a bit like a leap and it's a little challenging. Um, but what ends up happening is, it's like, why would you do this? Well, you're gonna get quicker reporting, right? You already have those relationship maps in place, so that six hours can get down to more like 30 minutes, right? Getting that information faster. Um, being able to have quicker time to resolution. So if you have an issue, you, you already have that relationship map, right? And I know there's some like change management databases out there that have similar types of information. There's products like Xenos um, that, that do similar type of thing from, a, from an operation standpoint, but that, that's not necessarily helpful you know, in, in a PowerShell script standpoint, right? Uh, when you're trying to automate, that's, that's helpful from, from an operation standpoint and be able to get visibility, but. Um, PowerShell's free. And PowerShell's free, <laughs> and that's a really excellent point. Like the, the, the cost and barrier to entry of PowerShell is phenomenal, right? It's the, it's the best value in IT, right? And, and then from here, you also can do faster implementation. So let's say that you do need to make that type of change. You're able to go in and, and execute and find the information and find those relationships and, and execute those commandlets regardless of where you are in the stack without having to do the query, right? And you know, in, in the work that I'm doing, and, and again, it's still, still early, uh, you know, if, if it's changed and it's not accurate, it'll throw an error, just handle the error, right? Then you do your query, right? You know, if, if in the catch, you know, there's an error, do the query and see if it works that time, right? And update, and then you can just update the object, right? Um, improving the value stream, you know, from a DevOps perspective, you know, being able to reduce time, because I'm not kidding myself, right? In some respects, this is only gonna shave a little bit of time on the things that we do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. But when you start looking at things that you're doing frequently, um, like provisioning out environments and destroying them and, and moving your software development life cycle, you know, seconds make a big difference, right? Um, so yesterday during the talk about dynamic parameter sets, I, mean, I started thinking and I brainstormed with several of you about you know, the ramifications, the things that you could do. 
right? When, when you're going to deploy, knowing that there's um, certain data stores that would be preferred, certain capabilities, you know, if you know it needs to be on the VLAN and you want to keep it isolated to a specific surfer, server, since you already have the data collected, you can pre-populate in your functions, you know, the, um, well, what do they call it again? Um, started with C. Help me out here, folks. Uh, the dynamic parameters. Uh, anyway, so it'll pre-populate you know, options so that when you go to choose, you can see the ones that meet up. So you can have all the networks listed with the VLAN associated or you know, have the storage with the percent free so that you're identifying something that you know, has more resources available. You know, making it easier for the user to be able to you know, do this automation without having to do all those queries and lookups and understand everything that's happening in the background, right? And then um, when you look at the extensibility into other tools like Vralize Orchestrator, for instance, or Power Actions, like I mentioned, um, or Microsoft Orchestrator, whatever, System Center, ServiceNow, anything that can execute a script, right? Being able to speed that implementation has tremendous value because there's a truism I learned, right? And you've probably seen this in your environments as well. When you're delivering IT services to people, they will they will fight against your processes if uh, if they feel like they can get it faster another way. They will spend budget stupidly often to get something faster. Right? And so what we found was if you wanted people to fall in line with your process and things like that, you make it super fast and easy for the preferred way and painfully difficult the other way. Take cost completely out of it. Right? And so when you start demonstrating that not only are you delivering a service, but you can deliver it faster and more uh, succinctly, efficiently, Right, very consistently, you'll you'll find that your adoption to those efforts will go way up. Um, same goes for when you're sharing scripts. So when you look at implementing something with Power Actions and Vralize Orchestrator and sharing code with others, you know I, th I think most of us would tend to deliver a function, right? Because I know in the environments I worked in that I would create a script and and I would tell them, and I think we've all done this. I think we all still do from time to time, but at the very top you have you know some uh, some documentation there, right? And then you say fill out these four fields that are associated with you know your environment for running this script, right? And and then go and then dot source it and run it and things like that. Well, as you look to you know increase adoption, you turn those things into functions, and not only do you make it to where they are filling out information. You could then extend the parameter set or the uh, dynamic <coughs> parameters. Um, you, know, you can extend that, pulling from that data, uh, and you're now giving them an opportunity to do it faster with less effort. And more importantly, they don't have to call you asking you how to use it. Right. So when I think about the growth areas in this, uh, I I like Yoda. When I when I think about the growth areas in this, you know, I, I especially look at DSC. Right and PowerShell classes, um, being able to you know, create you know, resources and, and implement DSC and be able to leverage those relationship maps in order to ensure consistency in, in the environment, right? Or the other way around, right? DSC is setting the configuration, right? And you just pull the information from the DSC mod files, right? Because when you still have to go out and do things and identify what's happening and where it's going, DSC isn't going to do everything at this point, right? We're going to get to a place where DSC is capable of managing multiple layers of the stack. Um, but you know, I was only able to find Cisco UCS that had a DSC resource outside of what, what Microsoft was delivering. Are there any others that you know of that Microsoft has not delivered? Yeah, so that's that's kind of what I that's kind of what I what I thought too. Um, and I also think from from a growth standpoint, as we continue to see people move away from snap-ins and, and go more towards modules, it gives you an opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, to kind of extend this 
out a, a great deal, right? To be able to do more uh, in, in the environment, uh, you know, just directly from where to, whatever system that you want, right? You don't have this you know, cumbersome installation process and managing all of those. You just simply make sure that the module is loaded. All right, so this is kind of near the end of the talk, but I'm, I'm gonna log into the lab here in just a minute, assuming the internet connection and you know, we can kind of walk through some of, some of these uh, different integrations can kind of talk about this a little bit if you want to. Okay, and if you don't, then we, we don't have to. It's, it's totally up to you. But um, any questions thus far? Because you've been way too quiet. So we're doing something similar with JSON files. Just keep it and do it static. Are you think you're doing dynamically that we will query every night and if you have new clusters and mm -hmm. networks, it's going to add to this JSON and you just keep kind of like, I know the granular network is going to add a map yeah, so I'm still trying to, to sort out, I wish I had a whiteboard, because whiteboards and me get along really, really well. Um, so, the, so the question was, you know, how, how do you, you know, do updates? What, what's the plan for updating the JSON or updating the information? Because there, there is this opportunity for the information to become stale, right? If something changes uh, in, in the environment. And uh, so what I'm working on right now primarily is identifying the situations where a change would occur. Right, like in, in, a, in a typical environment, what, what type of things would make a relationship map change? Um, and some of those would be like vMotion, like a virtual machine moves over, uh, you add additional resources that are tied to something else, right? You add a disk, you add a new network, adding things like that. Removing things obviously would, would make a change. Um, so from a from a data integrity standpoint, it's really what we're coming to, right? You know, is this data going to be stale? Is it still going to be useful? Um, I I've thus far found that the number of changes are relatively small, and if I think if we look at what information we're collecting, because like let's go back to maybe we won't do it that way. Yeah, everybody gets to watch all the slides again, the other way around, right? Um, when you think about what information that you need to collect all the way up the stack. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure how much change we, we really would expect. And it was one of those I'm, I'm kind of unsure about how I want to deal with that. Because I've also looked at maybe using SQL Server, right, and using and just create a relational database of, of all this stuff. Because I treat, at present, I'm treating network, storage, compute separately. Right? and pulling and collecting that information separately because they are relatively tied to each other. Um, and identifying where you, know, you, you have things that cross across you know, those, two, those three stacks. Right? Um, because at some point you just kind of have to draw the line of like, how you're going to be able to collect the information. And when I'm doing this, I'm really focused on these, right? those points. So I'm, I'm building functions that collect those points. And so the intent is that once I build these functions and I have all those relationships mapped out, you could then just pick the ones that matter to you that are, are interesting, put it in there, and run those individually, right? And so they can run on their own in the background at whatever frequency you want and update that data as you go, right? So this is why I really wanted to leave time to talk about this because I don't pretend that I have all the answers and I certainly don't pretend that I know how to solve this problem. But I do know that especially in environments where there's scale, this is a problem, right? And it's a problem a lot of us are going to face as we start getting more and more layers of PowerShell, right? Now, in my poll, you know, they said 33% of the people polled, I think there was 40 votes, were managing seven plus layers or items in their, in their stack. Um, I'm sure somebody in here is doing that, right? Anybody, anybody would classify themselves as seven plus layers? One, one, going twice, two. Okay, full. Well, let's go back to the, you get to watch the presentation again, backwards. There is a go to function. Is there? Uh, my mouse wasn't cooperating. 
I tell you right now, if I can figure out how to, how to automate building a PowerPoint deck, oh, yes, that would just, I would have more time to write code, honestly. I spend way too much time having to do that straight. I love it. So, all right, so when we, when we look at this, all right, so how many would say one to two? Three to four? Five to six? And then we already established a couple of people doing the seven wrong. So what's going to happen to everybody that's only doing a couple, right? Here's what's going to happen over the next few years. One, you're going to do refresh cycles on, on the things in your infrastructure, right? You're going to buy new things. And as PowerShellers and people who have influenced their organization to automate and use PowerShell and get value, you're going to have influence in that buying decision. You should, right? You're going to look for things that have PowerShell you know, integration as a capability, right? It's going to become value for, for, valuable for you. And in doing so, you're going to then say, all right, I got a new tool, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna, I'm gonna PowerShell this bad boy, and then you're gonna run into all these things about figuring out, like, how does this connect to that, right? How, how do I get this to happen faster, right? And, I, and that's, that's one of the things that I, I found challenging, because I put this poll out because, I'm gonna say, is this a problem that a lot of people are facing yet? And I feel like there should be, but I don't care a whole lot about it. So I'm either way off the reservation with this, but I think what we're going to, to see is that we're gonna see this problem creep up more and more because that increase in extensibility is going to expose all of you to more opportunities to, uh, to automate. Because the other side effect of greater extensibility is that consumption model change that I talked about earlier. Right. The way that we're consuming the resources that we buy today is very different than the way we did it five years ago. And it's crazy different than what we were doing 10 years ago. Right. And I suspect it's going to be crazy different five years from now. Right. And I get the question frequently, and they're like, well, Josh, you know, you talk about you know, power shelling everything and, and you know, all this extensibility. Isn't there just going to be other tools that's going to do all this work and we just won't script anymore? Does anybody in this room believe that in five years we won't need a script anymore? Right. You got one. It's, it's good to have one. There's always one. I'm usually the one. Um, so we're, we're not going to see this major drop off of this need to script and, and execute in an environment. Right? You're still going to have to do tasks that even if you have this very robust management plane that can execute all these things, there's just some things it can't do. Because if it did do all of that, nobody would want to use the tool. It would be too cumbersome, too complex. Right? You'd look at it and you're like, there's just too much here. I mean, we see that with uh, vSphere and System Center sometimes, right? You know, there's things that you wish were there and there's things that you just wish would go away because you don't ever need them or use them. So you can't, you know, nobody should ever expect that there's going to be one tool that's going to change all of it. What is going to happen though is that as those tools grow and you start implementing them in your environment, they are going to have hooks where you can execute PowerShell, right? Um, especially once it goes to Linux, if it ever does. I hope it does. That would be fun. I would love to have PowerShell on my Mac because then I would know how to use my Mac. <laughs> and so, you know, as you, know, as, as you are looking at your environments and the things you're doing, you're going to start seeing that you have more accessibility, more capability. You know, those silos, you know, I wouldn't say they're, they're disappearing, but the focus is much more on how can we help one another, right? How, how can we leverage PowerShell to, to do something, you know, on this side of the stack? And I think we're going to see that you know, those relationship mappings are going to be critically important. So here in about the next two weeks, I will have on my GitHub repo, I'm going to have, you know, the app DNA repo where I'm going to start putting these functions. And I would really love and appreciate anybody that wanted to come in and contribute to that and engage in this conversation some more. Um, because I think it's, unless Sapien makes a tool for this, <laughs> or somebody, I, I think it's just something that we're going to continue to see pop up on a regular basis. You said you got the time down for 22 hours with different mm -hmm. PowerShell servers. Do you use workflow at all? I didn't at the time. It wasn't an option. Okay. Yeah, that was four years ago. Oh. Yeah. So, and, and that's the other thing, right? You know, some, of the, some of this, 
we're, we're getting a lot of new capabilities and tools to help solve some of these, you know, some of these challenges, um, and, and improve the way that we're executing. Uh, I haven't used them because I don't have a big environment anymore, right? So has anybody learned this? Are you doing that? Yeah, we're using workflows, what's the name? And we manage, depending when it needs to go to be sent to get information, it's to then go to uh, SCAM, mm -hmm. SCCN, to get, just kind of all graph pieces and then put it together. Right. So we got down to like 10 minutes creating VMs using JSON templates. Like 10 minutes per VM, but if we do 10 or 20, it's only 15 minutes. Right. Right. And so what he was saying is leveraging workflows to go out and collect information from different places into a single location to execute creating a virtual machine and getting that time down. Right. So, yeah, absolutely something you can do. You have a question? Oh, so, uh, any recommendations on an infrastructure that's completely automated in the Linux world, whereas on the Windows side, it's nothing. That way, so we are kind of in a starting phase. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're trying to, we have a, an infrastructure completely automated on the Linux world, right. and nothing has been thought on the Windows side. So, so and to repeat what he said, like in, in their environment on the Linux side, complete automation up and down on the Windows side, nothing. So why do you think that is? Well, I think it's mostly, to start off, it's uh, silos and... Mm -hmm. So silos. And mostly toward like spearheading changes. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to now educate people more towards automation side rather than yeah. go for toward like... I think we'll create a CR wait for a couple of days and then get it back. And being a CI CD engineer, we're trying to automate stuff. Right. So, but again, it goes back to the priorities. Right, exactly. Well, yeah, as I guess every, you know, so what he's saying is just you know, educating people and making it a priority to do the automation. Like, I mean, I think that's you know, fundamental. I mean, this is it, right? Let's just show everybody this. Let's just posh it real good. Um, you, you've probably seen the image. It's got the two people that are pushing a cart. It's got square wheels, right? And there's two people right behind them that's got round wheels. And they said, the guy's pushing like, no, we don't have time for right, that right now. Right? <laughs> just, just show them that. And be like, um, so when, when you think about that, and this is... You know, how do you make that change? Like, how do you, you know, ele you know elevate that conversation, get them to start talking about it? Uh, I primarily just say quick wins, little bits here and there, right? And that's like when I when I look at the app DNA stuff, I really want it to be modular and, and extensible enough that you just grab the little bits that you need. You don't have to use every every bit of it. You can grab little bits to do small parts. Maybe get that build time from 12 minutes to 10 minutes, or down to eight minutes, or you know. Every bit that you do helps and just kind of feeds because now you've bought yourself more time and now you can start looking at more opportunities. Do you have I've kind of got a, a, a comment actually. Um, I'm a contractor, I work for a client on a big environment orchestration project and one of the reasons why I came to this was because I'm one of the seven plus. And yeah. What I find it is like whenever we provision a, a server, like you said, there's a whole lot of layers like when we say we want a new SQL server, we you know, uh, send a call, we do things with SolarWinds, or we put stuff in our automation database, we provision the VM, we configure all these items on the OS level. But, um, and there's probably like five or six different actual appliances that we put, you know, insert new records into or read records from and that sort of thing. And what <clears throat> good thing about, you know, the whole DevOps mentality is all that is essentially just an API. Mm -hmm. So we make, an API call to a SQL database, well, quote unquote, an API call to a SQL database, an API call to the IPM service, or an API call to Azure, all that stuff. And PowerShell allowed us to, is essentially like the glue that glued all of that stuff together mm -hmm. that allowed us to just, at the point we don't have to know what all, what all these appliances do, we just have to make a quick API call, bam, 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 and PowerShell orchestrates the whole thing. Yeah. And, and I, I highly recommend that, right? And, and the funny thing is, is that when, when I think of, you know, what I'm, this concept, like, it's doing exactly that, but trying to store in a stateful manner where you're not constantly making the queries. Yeah. I, I haven't been able to test it in a large enough environment to, to be able to, to say how much impact it's going to have, right? Um, so I'm hoping later this year people will be able to tell me. <laughs> 
Okay. So you're talking about how you now have a six hour process to kind of refresh that state data. Mm -hmm. And then you're considering, well, how, how often do I need to refresh that to make sure it doesn't right. go stale? And many of those relationships don't change. My suggestion would be, why not run that six hour process every night and then you can have the script send you an email if something changes. If an unexpected change happens, wouldn't you want to know about it? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that makes sense. Yeah, my, my intent would be a scheduled task that would go at some, some regular interval. Um, and, and then also, you know, adding little bits of code to do a query if that doesn't match up, right? Yeah. Um, because depending on what you're doing, you know, it doesn't have to be, and here's, here's the thing, right? When you look at how applications are being built and, and developed and, and put out into the world, they're much more modular, right? The, the monolithic app is becoming less. They still exist, they're still going to exist for a long time, but it's, it's much more going into little bits and chunks that do their little bit, right? What's that? Microservices. Microservices, exactly, right? And I, I think by enabling it with multiple functions that do very specific things and storing it into a central data set, you could probably keep it fairly real time, right? Or you just don't do those processes and, and only check when, you know, periodic, yeah, right? There's, and, and I think that there is no right answer. Right? There's, there is no, this is the way you have to do it, because I think everybody's environment is going to be completely different. Because right? you know, when you talk about the different use cases here, like, you know, he was talking about implementation. Right? Like, that's a day zero activity. Right? That is creating those relationships, like leveraging relationships and creating a new DNA, like a new app. Like, it's coming into the world with nothing, just like a child. Right? You have to give it everything. Right? And so that you know, that is going to be one operation. But when you look at how do you turn and life cycle it, like, how much does it change? Like, I wasn't born with a beard. I got a beard, <laughs> right? Sometimes the beard might go away, not frequently, because it gets itchy when it's not there. It just feels awkward. But, um, but when, you, when you start thinking about day zero versus day 720, or 730, 730, um, yeah, completely different uh, different needs, but the same information, right? So the the refresh on that, not sure. We actually we actually use a, a system just like this uh, for one of our largest clients, and we use a SQL database to store mm -hmm. it. Um, and what we wound up doing is we built a, kind of a transaction transactional model into that database. Okay. So now we can have trending reports. So I can show you what's our trend on VM builds. Are we starting to fill up on workstations, and how is that looking over time? Nice. So it's, it's, I think there's a lot of potential behind this, and having a community-driven solution for it is a huge idea. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to you contributing based on what you guys are doing. Absolutely. All right, you haven't thrown things at me, so I, I, I feel confident that I wasn't absolutely crazy here. I appreciate that. Anything else? All right, let me see if I can get to the environment now. Where's my mouse? Oh, it's over there. Hold on. All right, I'm connected. Appreciate your patience. Still learning how to use these Apple things. Somebody wants to buy me a Surface, I will absolutely get a Surface. Well, that's a little bit smaller than I would hoped. Sorry about that. All right, so little example of how this might might look. Can everybody see that? Okay. No. Yeah. Hold on. What is it? Control plus? There we go. All right. So this, this function is designed to, to go through and basically, you know, well, when I, when I work with customers, you know, 
a lot of them have used NFS or fiber channel and they're looking at high scales and they're like, oh, you know, I got to provision all this storage into my environment. I'm like, ah, it's a piece of cake, right? Here's a PowerShell function that'll do it. Um, but what we had to do, what I did here is I didn't want to just create a bunch of volumes and then tell the VMware administrator that they existed, right? Um, so we wanted to, I wanted to do some things that were dynamic uh, and I think it actually ran. So, uh, but, so what we're doing is we go in uh, and when you run the function, you identify that this is the cluster, you give it a cluster name, right? How many volumes you want, the performance characteristics of it, is this for an existing tenant, like an existing account? Is this a net new account? Uh, and then how do you want those organized on the storage system? And then provisioning it all to the vSphere cluster. And so let me make sure I'm logged into my vSphere environment. I'm not used to everybody watching me type, so. All right, and so what it does is when we go to set up, right, I'm, I'm collecting information as we go, right? I'm collecting cluster information, I'm collecting host information, I'm creating targets, I'm getting the, I collect the IQNs, right, from the storage system and I present them over to the VMware environment. All right, so there we go. There's the volume. I need to add those, the IQNs from the ESXi host to the solid fire storage system so that it knows and trusts that it can connect to that, right? And I'm leveraging multiple levels. So now I'm working on also doing some stuff with Cisco UCS where you can kind of configure like if they want a specific VLAN to connect to all the storage, things like that. Um, and then goes through and uh, rescans and it connects, right? So here, here you're creating, adding the data stores, you know, you do a scan, identify the data stores exist, we're going to pull the volume name from the, the storage system, right? So we can make the data store match the volume name that, uh, that's on the storage system so that it's easier for you to talk with your storage administrator about which system that you might need to change, right? And, and then it just adds the data store. You create a new data store, right? So you're, you're dealing with multiple layers of the stack there. And the bulk of the work in this is really identifying those relationships. Like when something breaks, it's because I didn't map something correctly, right? Which is kind of what got me down this path. Uh, let's see. All right. And so now, yeah, it's all disconnected. That's sad. It's not a good example when it's not working, is it? So, all right, well, let me show you the power action stuff as well while we were talking about that. So this is Power Actions, as I, I was describing earlier. So I'll go to the home screen real quick. Once you install it, it allows you to create these scripts that uh, can be accessed you know, directly through the vSphere web client. All right? And so you know, I've got several of them that you know, I've, I see on a regular basis. Now, I'm, I'm not a big fan of storage, but I work in a storage company, so I, I talk to a lot of people about storage, right? Um, so, you know, a few things that, that we run into are like changing queue depth and changing, uh, you know, naming, changing performance characteristics. And in order to do that successfully without reaching across silos, if you will, going into a storage team, you have to make that relationship, right, and do that query. And currently, it works fine, it just takes longer to execute all of these. And since my other script didn't run, I can't actually show them in action. But I can show you how it works. Uh, here's the PowerShell I console that I mentioned, right? It's it's oh, I'm not connected, but yeah, it's PowerShell. Like it just runs. Right. All right, let's go to this. And so when you right click, oops, say execute script, and it will tell you what's there. You select which one that you want to run, and it'll prompt you. Um, I don't think I can run any of those because the storage is disconnected. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and, and what it allows you to do then is to be able to identify or execute things or report back and identify how this relates to other things. Like you can have a report that says, you know, 
give me all the snapshot information, give me all the, the VLANs that are being used that are associated with this host you know, on the Cisco UCS or something like that. Make sure that those two match up. Right. So we've got some customers that are, that are working on doing that. So that makes sense. I wish I could run it, but I mean, I can do the local data store. I guess my PowerShell server is broken. I'm sorry. That's what I get for updating it to version 5 and not testing before this conference. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> Any other questions, thoughts? Funny stories? <laughs> so, honestly, I noticed on your third slide you had the whole VMware stack. And yeah. All this stuff. At the very top of it, you had Orchestrator. Yeah. I'm curious how you how you use Orchestrator. Because uh, we've developed this you know, great PowerShell script that makes all these decisions for us. Yeah. And I feel silly putting it in Orchestrator because I'm just. <laughs> I've just taken all that logic out and I yeah. build it or, or I'm drawing videos or something that's stupid like that. Yeah. So how, how do you use it? When, when do you use it maybe? So yeah. Yeah, so I, 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 I use Orchestrator primarily if there's any decisions that I need to make, if there's going to be any branch. Like if anything will change as a result of a condition, right? Or I need to do things, um, Right, like it will change due to a condition, right? It says that if if this condition condition exists, go this way. If it doesn't, go that way. I tend to use Orchestrator for that. But it also really comes down to, you know, with, with Orchestrator, what you have plugins for and what you have actions and workflows for, and and that's where you hit a point and you're like, well, time to go to PowerShell, right? And then you can call from that. So I I've tended towards Orchestrator primarily, and again I'll. I'll you know, when I talk about the hammer, like when you hammer everything's a nail, like I always start with PowerShell. I force myself to use Orchestrator and other tools. Um, the biggest advantage, and I, I didn't show it here, but right here is the same idea. Um, you know, so that's VRI's Orchestrator is also object aware in the vSphere web client and it's supported, like fully supported. Right, so you can create the workflows right in there. So a lot of stuff that I'm talking about, you can do with Orchestrator as well. This is PowerShell conference. <laughs> um, uh, but with Power Actions, it, uh, it, I like it because uh, it also allows me to do more things because Orchestrator doesn't cover everything. So. And that's the part that I'm struggling with yeah. is that I, I want to I want to expose something simple to people. Yeah. I don't want to let them run. Window. Yeah, and, and for me, everything is, if I can just give you an opportunity to run it and you not care how it's built on the back end, yeah. So I, I tend towards Orchestrator primarily because it's fully supported from, from VMware, um, and it's not handing someone a PowerShell last script. But if you look at my GitHub repos, like, it's all PowerShell stuff, right? I haven't released the Orchestrator stuff yet, but um, we have some customers using it. I just don't, you know, I help them, but I don't. I don't publish it. Because uh, requirement to run Power Action for this of your client? Yeah, so the, the primary requirements you have to have a PowerShell server. And you when you do the install, um, you have to make some modifications to the uh, uh, virtual center server appliance. And there's some files that you have to make a slight modification to. And those that modification is just so it'll show up in you know in the in the UI. Um, I think it's 5.5 .5, uh, is the one with the new the newer VSphere web client. Uh, so it, I, I run it in 6. I had it running in 5.5. .5. I don't think it's supported in 5.1 because I just don't think that the, uh, the web client functions with it. And then from the PowerShell side, um, uh, server 2012. Actually, I'm going to pull it up. <coughs> So it's labs.vmware.com slash flings, and their site was down the other day for maintenance, so I'm hoping it's back up. It is, good. What's that? There we go. So look for power actions, and it goes right in the system requirements. Uh, 5.1 is included. Okay, so that, that one is included. Right, server to 2003 or higher, 
.NET Framework 4 and 4.5, and then um, all the PowerShell versions. And of course, you know, whatever version that you have. And here's the thing, right? You have to have all the modules for the different layers of infrastructure on that PowerShell server, otherwise it can't run. Right. No, it'll be separate unless you're running the Windows Windows version, right? If you're running the Windows version of the Virtual Center server, it can all be native. Yeah, yeah. I think I think uh, VMware's made it sufficiently painful to run the the Windows version. I think a lot of people have you know, they've improved the the uh, appliance sufficiently that a lot of people have moved over to that. At least that I'm seeing. Anything else? Where can we get your book? <laughs> There's one right here for you. I told you it was subjective. <laughs> uh, no, so the so the book's on Amazon, um, and you know if, if if you're interested in understanding like different tools like Chef and Ansible and Puppet and just DevOps principles, and, and it is it is an entry level for all those tools. Right, it's not intended to be um, a deep dive. Right, it's very much you run a VMware environment, you're operating a traditional IT organization, um, and you're looking at these tools and, and moving towards that. This is an introduction to all that, which also made you know when I was asked to contribute, it was I think December of 2013, maybe 14, 2014, 13. DSC was new. There was very little out there. There was very few people that had even done anything. So it was one of those you dig in and you get cut and you bleed and, <laughs> and you figure that out. And then, and then, and then I get a point, you know, that's the first chapter, right? This is how to get it set up and, and how it works. And I get to the second chapter and I'm like, what's anybody going to do with this, right? Most of the resources are limited and they're not supported and they have nothing to do with VMware. Right. And so the second chapter is all the things that you can't do at DSC, and then this one interesting thing that you can <laughs> at the time. But you know, if there's a new new version, there should be a whole <laughs> lot more stuff, and I don't want to write it. <laughs> Writing really sucks. Yeah, so I asked how much you thought you would rewrite if you were to uh, go about the task today. Oh wow! Um, how much would I rewrite? Uh, right now, nothing. Uh, here in a couple of weeks, I would consider doing doing a, a lot more um, you know, for that. Uh, I would say for uh, like the Mastering Beastfair book, if if there's an update to that, um, there'd be a lot, you know, a lot that's changed with Power CLI and the things that you're able to do with it, and it would definitely be a more of a touch on integrating with other uh, other tools as well, because it's you know as you saw in the survey, right? There's there's a growing amount of people who are getting more access to more layers. And I think that's the biggest change, right? You know, not, not being exclusively focused on uh, managing this one component, right? You know, how do you manage that component along with you know, their related components? I think that's the biggest change. All right, well, I, I guess I'll just close it out. If anybody wants to talk with me after, you'll get a little bit of time back. Um, you know, I, I hope that you know, this kind of gave you some insight into how Power, PowerShell is being leveraged across the stack. Uh, I also hope that you know, when you start thinking about some of the challenges of taking advantage of those, this kind of gets you in that frame of mind. Uh, I, like I said in the beginning, I don't pretend to have all the answers. Uh, I just simply know some of the questions that you need to be asking and, and wanted to feed some thoughts into how you might tackle those things. Um, and so uh, once I get that repo out, I'll make sure that I hit the PowerShell Summit hashtag you know, when, when I deploy that out and I'll let everybody know and I'll look forward to your contributions. Thank you for your time and your feedback and your uh, participation. I appreciate it. Uh, and despite what my wife says, I don't really feel the need to talk for long periods of time without talking to people talking back. So um, so thank you for that and I appreciate it. Thank you. Because I did forget.